Okay, we're back. So we are still on number 98. Uh, we're talking about the private life or the personal life of Bill Clinton, where it turns out that that personal life was a little more than his personal life since he was being accused of sexual harassment in the workplace. That makes it your public life as well, especially if you're a public official. Now, the same people who were so anti-Thomas, uh, Justice Thomas saying that he had said some crude things to make a woman feel uncomfortable. That was seen as being really, really important, so important that it might, he might not even be a judge. But then when it came out that he had sexually harassed a woman so much that she felt the need to go and turn him into the police to, um, to take him to court, that was suddenly, that's his personal life. We shouldn't be dealing with that. Then when it was discovered, he was actually having an affair in the Oval Office where he was doing work for the American people and the person he chose to have that affair with was somebody without any power whatsoever, very, very young. He was in his 50s. She was in her 20s. She was like 21, so ick on a bunch of levels. Um, suddenly that was okay. Okay, so... Okay, I'm still recording good. Um, here we go. As Commander-in-Chief, Clinton also urged Congress to lift the ban on homosexuals in the United States military. His implementing his implementation of that was not, okay, we're going to make it available for all gay people to serve in the military. Instead, it was don't ask, don't tell. If you are a gay person in the military, fine, just keep it to yourself. We don't care. Um, so it became, it, it was a way to keep people from being sought out. And because before this time, if you were discovered to be a homosexual while in the military, they could actually kick you out. And that would be a, um, a dishonorable discharge. But there's a third part to this and it was don't pursue. So that was like, don't seek out homosexuality in the military. That was the third part of that. Now, Hillary Clinton, because she was so uh, determined to be part of this presidency. Uh, she campaigned heavily for a national health care plan or socialized medicine that was to be paid for by businesses and their employees. A lot of businesses already offered health care as part of a benefits package to their employees, but she wanted to make it absolutely mandatory for every business to do this, which would not be um, really Able, uh, some business wouldn't be able to do that because they really didn't make that much money to begin with. So it would be a, a choice of either you can't hire somebody, so you're going to fire someone, or you have to figure out a way to pay for their health insurance. So her her system was, we need a cost-effective, high-quality health care system guaranteeing health care to all our people as a right. And this is where we first start seeing this idea of it's the right of a person to have health care. Um, but nobody has the right to demand somebody else provide them with a service. You don't have that right. You don't have the right to go into a doctor's office and say, you must serve me. It's my right because it's their right to say no. <laughs> okay. Now, this is um, really important to her because she doesn't want to be seen as just the first lady. She wants to be seen as a political animal in her own right. Every first lady has a project that they do while they're in office. For uh, Laura Bush, it was, um, I'm sorry, for, let's start with Barbara Bush, the first George Bush's wife. Um, for Barbara Bush, it was, I believe, illiteracy was, she was fighting against illiteracy. For uh, Nancy Reagan, it was say no to drugs. And boy, she got blown up for that one so many times. Uh, for Hillary Clinton, she wanted it to be more than just a, a pet project. She wanted to be like the czar of the national health care plan. And then um, Laura Bush is going to be about public libraries. And our current first lady was all about, I'm sorry, Obama's wife was uh, all about uh, school nutrition. That didn't work out for her, well for her. And then um, right now it's our current uh, first lady's thing is uh, bullying, online bullying, which again, isn't really working out for her because her husband is online quite a lot. And sometimes he says stuff that can come across as bullying. So it's a bummer. Okay. But Hillary Clinton was really pushing for this healthcare system. Conservatives warned that the average person would end up paying more in taxes. And that would make, say it with me, 
unemployment's going to go up. Yay! Prices are going to go up. And they're going to become more dependent on the government. But they're also going to receive substandard care. That was the hallmark of socialized medicine. By 1996, the plan was dead. So it did not go anywhere. Um, this is a big problem when you have government trying to run a health care system. You, you always end up with substandard care. Even when the government tries to pay money to a system to try to help it out, when the government gives money to a system, the prices of that system go up every time. Okay, Tax Freedom Day. This is the day in the year when all of your earnings stop going to taxes. If we took up all the money you owe in taxes for everything, how long would it take you in the course of a year to earn enough money just to pay your taxes? By 1994, the average American worked about six months out of the year just to pay taxes. And those taxes are used specifically to run a huge, bloated government. Okay, America was losing its goodness that Alexis de Tocqueville spoke of in 1831. He said, America is great because America is good. When America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Uh, in his book... Uh, I read it. It's, it wasn't my, my thing, but if you want to read it, go for it. He said, not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the greatness and genius of America. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. There was some moral decline in the 1990s, including an increase in white collar crime. This is people in business stealing money from that business. They're skimming off the top and they're going to go to prison for it. There was an increase in gambling on the state level. Most states did not have legal gambling. California did not have legal gambling until they decided to include a lottery. Suddenly lotteries became the way that states are going to make money. Uh, I lived in California at the time when the California lottery was first being introduced to the people of California and it was being introduced as a way to save the public schools in California because out of every dollar spent in the California lottery, 33 cents will go to the public schools. What happened? Because the public schools are always being touted as being like garbage holes. I mean, they're always complaining that they need to update the classrooms. And we're always voting on new measures to put money into the public school. Where's that money from the California lottery? They are raising billions of dollars. Shouldn't the schools be like tricked out to the max? I mean, come on, I went 80s there for a minute. Shouldn't they really have like everything? What's going on with that money? That's a problem. There is also a greater increase in the acceptance of pornography to the point where, not kidding, but in the 90s, um, <laughs> one of the newscasters, like one of the talking heads on a, a TV, TV news anchor was actually praised for the fact that she posed in Playboy. And you're like, why is this a thing? And why is it on my evening news? And why is she saying thank you to the two men on either side of her who are holding the magazine she's in? And that means they've just seen her naked and a photograph. It's gross. Can we stop this, please? Ugh. Okay. There was also judicial weaknesses. Judges began to give light sentences returning criminals to the streets. Education was failing. Failing big time. By 1994, this is why education is starting to fail, basic phonics, that's the sound that letters make, was no longer being taught in public schools. It was being edged out. The sound that letters make is kind of important for a kid to know how to read. They should know their phonics. Math drills, traditional math drills, like the addition tables, subtraction tables, multiplication tables, division tables had been virtually eliminated from school curriculums. The things that kids need to memorize so they can do higher maths quickly was being gotten rid of. As a result, many students' grades begin to fall. And we're talking into like the bottom basement fall. 
So a reliable study classifies 30% of public school students as learning disabled. So that's a reliable study. The federal government said, oh, so we'll help the public schools by giving them money for their, dis their disabled students. So the public school system said, oh, we get money if we have disabled students. You know, they look disabled. And so do they, and so do they, and this one. And suddenly, way more than 30% of the students in the schools are being classified as learning disabled, specifically so that administrators would get more money. Many students who are labeled as learning disabled use that label as an excuse not to put any effort into the work. We've had both at our school. We've had some kids who said, I'm learning disabled, can't do anything. And they just sit there and, you know, do complex things on their own that they want to do, but they won't do any actual schoolwork. And then I've had other students who have come in with serious learning disabilities and they have worked their tails off and they have gotten really good grades because they put in the effort. It's almost like that happens with everybody. But as adults, people who have are using that label as an excuse, they act like they're incapable of doing any kind of higher education, any kind of working, the ebb of a menial job. They have to go on government programs in order to support themselves. That's baloney. There's a lot of people who are learning disabled who can actually become great citizens and who can become great workers. Okay, this guy, John Rowan, he says, success is neither magical nor mysterious. Success is a natural consequence of consistently applying the basic fundamentals. Well, first schools were taking the basic fundamentals away. Then they were labeling people as learning disabled and then just expecting them not to learn. So people took them up on that. Oh, I'm not expected to learn. I'm not going to learn. But guess what? People who have a learning disability doesn't make them doesn't make them stupid. In fact, people who have some behavioral and learning disabilities are the people who are running major multimedia corporations because they have ADHD and they can think of 50,000 things at once and they can put all this stuff together, okay? The people who are in this picture, they've all been classified as learning disabled and yet they are some of the biggest producers you'll ever see. Can we stop treating people like they're incapable just because they learn differently? So one of the most important developments in the 1990s was the World Wide Web, WWW, or the internet. Now, our vice president during Clinton's time, a man named Al Gore, went on record as saying that he invented the internet. The man who really invented the internet was quite shocked by that. He's like, I'm pretty sure you weren't in the room when I did that. So, no. He still, you know, still, well, you know, I, I was a big part of the internet. No, he wasn't. The internet was actually created as a military tool. So, he, I mean, he's a tool, but he's not military. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, you've got uh, Al Gore saying he invented the internet. He did not. Nothing to do with it. This guy was the guy who did it right here. This guy, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. He developed the first web page in 1990. Thank you very much, sir. The use of cellular telephones surged in the 1990s. Yes, look at how they improved over time. Woohoo! We went from the great big brick to, in 1992, it looks like a satellite phone almost. Um, all the way up into uh, 2002, just 18 years ago, look at that, where yeah, people were actually getting the internet on that little teeny tiny screen. <laughs> Development of Global Positioning Systems, or GPS. In 1978, the U.S. Department of Defense launched its first in a series of satellites that would form the GPS because it's a system, so there's multiple parts of it. Basically, it's a multiple multiple parts of satellites all grouped together in specific areas that can pinpoint locations. In 1993, the system consisted of 24 satellites. They orbited the Earth every 12 hours. In 1991, GPS played a key role in the outcome of the 1991 Gulf War in Iraq. The U.S. government gave each of the um, military leaders in their convoys GPSs to use. Uh, I actually know somebody who was in one of those convoys, and he said, the GPS the government gave me was garbage, so I pulled out the one I bought at 
Target before I left and use, or Radio Shack before I left and I used that one. It worked great. But it did play a key, war, a key role in the outcome of the 1991 Gulf War in Iraq. In 1993, U.S. government authorized civilian use of the system. It became a multi-billion dollar industry. And we have it now on our phones. The Human Genome Project. This was a massive effort to identify all of the approximately 30,000 genes in human DNA. The reason for this was they wanted to identify all those genes, develop a genetic linkage map of the human genome to figure out how people move from place to place and how they evolved over time, to obtain a physical map of the human genome, develop technology for the management of the human genome information. And that's when everybody said, well, what are you trying to do now? Why are you trying to manage the what's going on here? We want to know the function of genes. It's kind of important. Determine sequences of the 3 billion chemical base pairs that make up human DNA. Store that information in public databases. <clears throat> Does that mean my, my information is going to be made public? That's concerning. To develop tools for data analysis to transfer the technologies to the private sectors. Again, there's some really good goals in here. And then there's some goals where you're just like, is that going to be good for the American people? Okay, the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA, called for the elimination of tariffs and other trade restrictions between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Those are the three countries that make up North America. You live on the North American continent. You share the North American continent with Canada and Mexico. I'm saying it like that because sometimes people just lose the really basic information, even in history classes. So in order for Canada, the United States, and Mexico to be able to trade freely without any kind of tariffs or anything, it was discovered instead of being a free, tr free trade agreement where we just basically open the border for trade, not for immigration, but for trade, um, it was discovered that because Mexico was so far behind Canada and the United States to be able to trade freely, the United States was required to give $4 billion to Mexico to bring them up to a level where they could trade freely with the United States and Canada. At that point, if you're paying $4 billion for free trade, it's not free. Under Clinton, Israel was pressured by the United States and the UN to give the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, control over the Gaza Strip. Now keep in mind, PLO, Palestine, Palestine Liberation Organization, people who called themselves Jordanians before they became known as Palestinians are saying that they want their land restored to them, which the land was never theirs. Sorry. Okay. They wanted control. They were given control over the Gaza Strip that is located on the map right next to the Mediterranean Sea. It's toward the south of the white part of Israel. And then they were given over the West Bank and Jericho in 1994. As soon as um, Israel was granted statehood, became a nation, um, the Palestinians, the newly calling themselves Palestinians, said, no, we want this land ourselves, even though the land all the way around Israel belongs to people who are of Arab descent, Middle Eastern descent, and are Jordanian and what we would call Palestinian. So the areas of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and, and uh, Egypt were not considered to be enough. They also wanted Israel as well. So Israel, right from the very beginning, said, we will agree to a two-state system. Palestinians said, no. Israel has offered on five different occasions to have a two-state system where they would give land to the Palestinians to start their own country. Every single time they have said no. Now they were given the Gaza Strip. Their immediate result, the immediate result of that was the Palestinians created the Gaza Strip they created a base there that they use to shoot missiles into Israel. They are not interested in living in peace with the people of Israel. The people of Israel, on the other hand, have a system of government that welcomes everyone of every race. They are accused of having apartheid in Israel. They are the only country in this area that does not have apartheid. It's the exact opposite. There's freedom of religion. You're just not allowed to convert somebody to your religion. 
Um, there is also equal rights between men and women. And there is um, equal rights among all citizens. No one is engaged in apartheid in Israel. It's not happening. In 1994, the CIA discovered that communist North Korea was building atomic weapons. So the United States threatened to impose economic sanctions. That means we won't sell them stuff. Okay. North Korea then invade, threatened to invade South Korea if sanctions were imposed. So we tell North Korea, stop building your atomic weapons because they're dangerous for everyone, or we're not going to sell you stuff. And they said, if you don't sell us stuff, then we're going to invade North South Korea on you. So after the communist dictator of North Korea died, his son agreed to freeze the country's nuclear program in exchange for technology and diplomatic, diplomatic and economic relations with the United States. So our president at the time said, okay, we will do that. Almost immediately, the new uh, dictator of North Korea began shooting off weapons, missiles toward the United States. They never landed. They always went into the ocean. They didn't have enough staying power to stay to make it all the way to the U.S. And the U.S. is just like, oh, goodness. Okay. President Clinton also continued to grant China the most favored nation trading status, despite the fact that they were always being accused of human rights violations. Um, he claimed that Americans needed to trade with China in order to remain a world economic power. Okay. The Clinton administration also pursued diplomatic and economic relations with communist Vietnam. Are you seeing the picture and the constant motif here? It's always shaking hands with another communist leader. Even though the Vietnamese government refused to adequately account for American POWs and MIAs, and that's going to make a lot of servicemen really angry with Clinton, actually. In February of 1993, because the United States is beginning to be seen as weak, because our, our president is shaking hands with all these communist leaders, there was a terrorist attack on the United States. A bomb exploded in a parking garage beneath the World Trade Center in New York City. It killed six people. It injured over a thousand people. Five Muslim terrorists were convicted of the crime. The building stayed up because it was designed to withstand that kind of structural damage. So it did not take down the World Trade Center. It was, you know, repaired, no problem. But it still killed six people and injured a thousand. And it also woke the people of America up that, hey, we are actually, you know, being targeted. In April of 1995, we found out we weren't just being targeted from the outside. We we're also being targeted from the inside. A bomb exploded outside of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. And it happened on a, it happened in a way that the man who was found guilty of this, he chose a date that was significant to him because he was angry that the government had overreached in a couple of really big ways. The first one was the government had gone after a family who were living kind of isolated and alone. And instead of approaching the family and saying, you know, is everything okay? Instead, they kind of, you know, demanded that the family come out and, um, and show that they were not anti-American or whatever and ended up killing people in that family. The second, I'm not really big on that one. So if you want to look up Ruby Ridge, you can do your own research on that one. The second big thing, and this is the one I'm a lot more familiar with, because I really didn't hear a lot of information about Ruby Ridge when, during the time it happened. Um, the next one was um, a cult that was um, in a, a, an enclosed area but in the middle of nowhere again, but, you know, they were a closed kind of society and information came out to the, the police in the area that there were women and children who were being sexually assaulted in this cult. And it was led by a man named David Koresh who taught that he was Jesus Christ and that this was the end times and he was preparing his people for the apocalypse kind of thing. And he had gathered a lot of guns and ammunition and everything else that he was storing in this compound. So the um, attorney general arranged for alcohol, tobacco, and firearms um, department to go to this place, to this 
compound and demand the surrender. Well, David Koresh was like, I'm not surrendering anything. I didn't do anything wrong. All the guns that I own are mine. They're in my name. I legally own them. We have the right to practice our religion any way we see fit. So we're not coming out. At that point, the ATF said, well, you need to come out because we need to talk to the people who, who are also in your um, group to make sure they're not being you know, sexually assaulted. This went on and on. There was a standoff. And then finally, somebody in the ATF opened fire and it caused an explosion and the whole thing just went up and a lot of people got killed as a result of that. So this man, Timothy McVeigh, said this is two times in the American government overstepped its bounds and demanded that people give up their freedom so that the government could step in and see what was going on. How dare they do such a thing? So he rented a great, a rider truck, a rental truck, um, and he filled it with fertilizer that when um, properly manipulated can act like a bomb. Okay, so he parked this rider truck in front of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, knowing full well that there was a daycare facility on the bottom floor of this building. He parked his truck right outside of that daycare center and set off the bomb. The bomb took out the entire front of the building. You can see the picture right here. 19 children were killed in that on day on-site daycare facility, 168 people total in the whole building were killed. Um, Timothy McVeigh was caught not too long afterwards. He was um, tried, he was sentenced, and he was executed for his murder of American citizens. They did ask him, what about all the kids that you killed? They are totally innocent of anything that you are accusing the federal government of doing. He said, ah, they were collateral damage. They just got in the way. In July of 1996, there was yet another bomb that exploded in Atlanta Centennial Park during the Olympic celebration. It killed one woman. It killed, it injured 111 people. Authorities later arrested an American radical who was wanted in connection with several other bombing incidents. But before they did that part, they went after one specific guy named Richard Jewell, who was a security guard at the Olympic Park. He located this um, backpack or duffel bag and he said, this seems suspicious. He reported it. It went off while he was reporting it and he was ended, ended up getting blamed and railroaded they tried to make him confess the um, press all said he did it. Um, the FBI who was investigating said, oh yeah, this guy did it without beyond a shadow of a doubt. And his name was dragged through the mud. People hated him. There were death threats against him. He was living with his mom to take care of her. And he was being uh, accused of being some kind of loser who's still living with his mommy because he can't live on his own. And he's like, I'm taking care of my mom who's, you know, housebound. Um, later on, when they discovered it was an American radical wanted with several other bombing incidents, the press just went, oh, OK, no apology. No. Oh, sorry. We totally ruined your life, dude. No, nothing. Uh, there was a movie that was just made about him like a year ago. So if you want to check it out. Check it on IMDb, see if it's suitable. You can get more information about that. Then in August 1998, American embassies in Tanzania and Kenya were destroyed by almost simultaneous explosions, killing 258 people. Both of those incidents were attributed to Al-Qaeda, a terrorist group that was headed by Islamic radical Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was born in Saudi Arabia, raised and schooled in London, England, and then went back to Saudi Arabia, decided he he believed in the most radical forms of Islam, and then basically moved to Afghanistan when the Russians were forced out of Afghanistan by the Afghani people. He went in and he arranged for their king to be overthrown and he filled that power vacuum. And he forced the people of Afghanistan to live by this very radical form of Islam. And he started um, terror attacks around the globe. He was a billionaire, by the way. He earned, he uh, inherited his money. <sighs> and then in 1999, two high school seniors armed with guns and explosives waged a violent assault on their own high school. 
Littleton, Colorado, Columbine High School. They killed 12 fellow students and one teacher before shooting themselves. And all kinds of um, theories were, were said about this. Well, it's because we have too many guns in the country. It's because we have violent video games. It's because we have, you know, a violent society. You know the real reason these two guys shot up the school? Because they were jerks. Okay? Can we just blame them? Instead of blaming everything else under the sun, can we just blame the two people who went after their own their fellow students and shot and killed them? We're talking about psychos here. Psychotics. I have no more patience for them than I do for Timothy McVeigh. I I don't need an excuse as to why they did this. They did it. They got what they deserved. Now, though characterized by scandal, his questionable foreign policy and his terrorism, both at home and abroad that he was fighting, the Clinton administration benefited from a thriving economy throughout the 1990s. Clinton was reelected for a second term in 1996. During his second term, he was under investigation for an incident of sexual harassment while he was governor of Arkansas. It had already been in play and it was still being, you know, there was a lot of, you know, finding, fact finding going on. And it was during that investigation that it was discovered he was also having an affair with a White House intern, Monica Lewinsky. Now, he has said that the reason he had the affair with the intern is because he was under a lot of pressure. Boo hoo. Okay, you wanted to be president of the United States. You became president of the United States. There's other ways you can relieve pressure. Uh, talk to a therapist. I don't know. Get to know your wife a little better. Maybe not embarrass your wife and child because he had a daughter living in the White House at the time. Don't have an extramarital affair in the White House. Don't be that guy. <sighs> Bill Clinton was impeached in 1998 by the House of Representatives because he lied while he was in court. And he also obstructed justice. He was the second president ever to be impeached. The Senate acquitted Clinton of the charges. In January of 26 in 1998, he said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And then in August, he said, I did have a relationship with Miss Lewinsky. That was not appropriate. The fastest growing and largest minority ethnic group in the United States in the 90s was made up of Spanish speaking or Hispanic Americans. Hispanic is the name that we get because people have immigrated from Spain. Okay, because the original name for Spain was Hispania. That was a Latin name given to them. So anybody who speaks Spanish is considered to have the Spanish language root. So people are called Hispanic if they speak Spanish. Most came from Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States, so they are still considered American citizens. People from Cuba often came um, asking for asylum, which means they left Cuba secretly, made it to the United States, entered a port of call, and asked for asylum. And then from Mexico, we have people who both who enter both legally and illegally across our southern border. By the 1990s, Black Americans had made many political and economic gains. Um, Oprah Winfrey, like a multimillionaire Black woman. Actually, the first woman ever to become a millionaire in the United States was a Black woman from the 19... No, 1870s, I believe it was. She developed a hair product that made her a millionaire way back in the day. Um, and then for political... We have um, Reverend, I want to say Jackson. Man, I really hope I'm right. Um, he actually ran for president a couple times and was actually seen as a civil rights leader, but then it was discovered that some of what he was doing was actually blackmailing a lot of companies into funding his campaigns saying that if you don't fund me, then I'll, I will find a way to ruin you and say you're a racist. Yeah, that was discovered. And then, of course, we have DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, which, you know, in the 1990s, I had this album. <laughs> it was good. It was really good. Um, so DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. DJ Jazzy Jeff was the guy who was running the turntable, and the Fresh Prince was the guy who was doing all the rapping. 
Okay, fun stuff. They released their first album. It was really good. Loved it. And they partied and they spent their money and then they turned around and they realized they were broke. They had blown through all of their cash from their first album. They were absolutely broke. So NBC approached Will Smith and said, we've watched your videos. You seem to have some good acting chops. Would you be willing to do a TV show on NBC? And he's like, yes, please, because he was broke. So he got, um, he made sure that his friend, um, DJ Jazz and Jeff, was also part of this um, show. And that was the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So fun fact, you can always tell when um, DJ Jazz and Jeff is going to get kicked out of the house, get thrown out because he's always wearing the same shirt. That stock footage. So they just get thrown out in the same shirt every single time. But yeah, he ended up doing that show in order to make his money back and then learned after he moved to Hollywood and started meeting other black professionals how to actually run his finances. And now he is one of the biggest paid movie stars in the world. And he also, um, while he was doing Fresh Prince, he was still rapping. And he released a, his second album actually made him a multimillionaire overnight. Again, crazy. Communist oppression prompted many Asians to flee to freedom in the United States and Canada. Education is a very high priority for Asian American families. And it's not because, you know, their race makes them smarter. Can we just get away from that kind of garbage and stop talk, being racist? Okay. Instead, it has to do with how families view themselves. They view themselves as a unit mo more in the East than in the West. In the West, we tend to be very individualistic. And so we look at how well we as individuals do. In Eastern cultures and a variety of Eastern cultures, there's a lot of them, um, it's really seen as the family is the whole unit and how you perform reflects on the entire unit of the family. So education is a high priority for Asian American families because it makes everybody look good. Asian Americans have a higher percentage of advanced degrees than any other ethnic group in America, again, because it makes the whole unit look good good and they want that family pride that's an important thing daniel ken inyoe he was the first japanese american to serve in the u.s congress representing hawaii in 1959 so early on patsy takimoto mink was the first japanese american to serve in congress she also represented hawaii because hawaii has a, a large japanese population Native American Indians experienced growth in the late 20th century. In the 1990 census, it recorded 1.5 million Native Americans. That was a record number in the United States. More Native Americans living on the continent now than any other time in history. Any other time. And they have become powerful. And it's awesome. So in our own backyard, we've got the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, which is a variety. It's a multiple group that all work together. Um, they have built this casino, um, on the other one there, I think they own some of the, yeah, the desert stores. So the Morongo band of mission Indians has become a very powerful force in politics, not just in our area, but in our entire state. So if you are part of the Morongo band of mission Indians, please, please, please finish your education because that was the primary goal for getting that casino built. The lawyers who were, um, who grew up in, on the reservation, worked really hard to get their law degrees to approach the state to get permission to get a um, casino started, specifically to give money to the children of the Morongo Band of Mission Indians so they could continue their education. So please show them that honor by getting your education. Finish it up. Okay, don't drop out of school, finish your education and get your second education as well, your secondary education. Go to college, get that degree, chase that dream, do it. You can do this. And if you can, learn your language. I don't want to see that language die. Ben Nighthorse, Nick Campbell. This was a Native American who in 1992 won a seat in the U.S. Senate. He was representing Colorado. And... The United States as a whole is considered a melting pot. This is the idea that many different cultures have come together in America with the understanding that all have to work together regardless of ethnic heritage or skin color. That's what a melting pot should be. Okay. 
However, when a person moves into another country, they're expected to learn the language and the basic customs. That doesn't mean you give up your own language and it doesn't mean you give up your own customs. It means you add to. That's important. When you move to another country, you add to. Okay. So if I move to France or England, I'd probably move to England because I speak English. I don't speak French. I'm terrible at languages. But if I moved to, to England, I would still be American. I would still like my American food and my American slang, but I would also have to embrace how the English live because I'm living in their country. I need to live as they do. Does that make sense? Okay. There's a big difference between having a melting pot and encouraging people of different nations and different cultural groups to get together. There's a big difference between that and multiculturalism, which is the new idea that's come out. This is the desire to return minority peoples to their tribal roots, which is just so unbelievably racist in its thinking that it just is so cringy. And yet the people who consider themselves multiculturalists see themselves as being anti-racist. And it's like, are you listening to what you're saying? They have the desire to return minority people to tribal roots. What are you saying? Tribal roots and religions. They should have a pre-Christian status as if Christianity has forced people to leave home and hearth and start something. No. Christianity is not a racial imperative Christianity started out in Asia and spread throughout the world. It's a personal relationship with Christ. It has nothing to do with changing someone's culture at all. Some people have seen multiculturalism as a new form of segregation. It keeps minority groups from becoming part of the American culture. And that needs to stop because we want to embrace other people's cultures as they embrace ours. Okay, that is it. We are done with that chapter. We have one chapter left to go and I'm gonna stop a little bit early, three minutes early, because when we come back, we're gonna continue this marathon. I'm gonna finish that last chapter, so help me. <laughs>